two is here, right? Dylan's here. One can raise his hand so you know who Dylan is. Uh, Bob's here. Okay, Bob's here too. He's he's not around, but Kevin's here, so he can take over. All right, well, uh, good morning. Uh, it's another year, time for another software update. Um, actually, it's been two years since we've had this meeting, so I'll be covering uh, changes in the last couple of years. Um, do we have a free presentation? Yeah, that's not much. Okay, let's do it, but let's try to get it on the screen here. Um, I know the first slide, I know the title of my presentation of what's new and different about Cedar, but the first slide we're just going to cover Bridge 75. Short answer is not much has happened in the last two years. So there's only one slide on Bridge. Um, EPA gave us uh, a little bit of trouble about uh, reporting uh, NOx and OQ. On, on not building the system even when uh, they did use it for unavailable hours. Uh, so the bridge did have that modification and that was going to be simply system repair. Uh, and then they made a bunch of changes for monitored bypass stacks to do a couple of customers who needed to have bypass stack. They have a settings on both main stack and bypass stack. Uh, so those were that was something just important slightly in 48 if you care and you probably don't because you probably don't want to run your bypass track right now. Anyway, those are the most significant changes in bridges over the last few years, and that's uh, not all I have to say about it. Not a whole lot of change. So we will go ahead and move on to uh, uh, the next thing. Hopefully, that will be on the screen here on the other side. <laughs> Sorry, just a second. Um, uh, so let's talk about something. Um, Calibration. Um, we made some changes to the uh, calibration <laughs> of over the last couple of years. Uh, one thing that was requested, I believe, in this very group meeting, was uh, to check for a calibration gap at the time that the calibration was performed. Now, the cal gap is that way. Also check for an expired cylinder. Expiration date is how they um complete the linearities. Um linearities. Uh, we have something set up on linearities. Again, if it's out of range, you get uh, on linearities it expects your high up to be even one hundred percent. It is it be 60, the lowest one is 30, somewhere in there. Um, when, when a linearity or a CPA, either one, uh, and when it's run, if the reference gas is outside of that range, you'll see an alarm. Uh, same thing, it will also check the expiration. So that's that. All right. Excuse me, Kevin. Yes. Uh, just some people were saying that they have to have a hard time hearing you. Could you approach the mic a bit? All over the place. And, uh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, what's the advanced thing? There's, and there's a pointer on there. Yeah. All right. We have a breeze on the Okay, redundant Cedar servers. We spent a lot of development time on this over the last couple of years. Our last uh, meeting two years ago, we've done a great 
or accept them uh, in accordance with Data, anyway, the basic idea is uh, either can run on two servers simultaneously, they call one primary, one secondary, they both run all the time. And the C to the monitor, which the operator C, uh, connects to the primary by the part. So it's, it's always looking at that one. Uh, if for some reason the primary goes down, whether that's power failure, actually the most common reason is uh, uh, system updates. So you know the IT group has to make sure they keep all you know, up with all the operating system updates. So they'll push updates back to the servers. Um, so the primary goes down, secondary is still running. And it takes over, it, it figures out primary went down, uh, and it takes over ready to the PLC. The monitor that is running in the control room that the operators are watching that also sees the primary went down, switches over to secondary, then there'll be an alarm saying, hey, you know, we switched over to secondary, you're okay. And don't worry about it, but uh, when the primary comes back up, uh, it'll take back over to the PLC, the CRD monitor will automatically switch back to the primary and all things off. Um, it is meant to be as, as seamless as possible. So that's, that's the idea. And those are physical servers. How about a virtual server? Yes, it will do it on virtual servers. However, I highly recommend running them on separate physical hosts. Sometimes the host itself has to be updated so that they're both running in both primary and secondary on one host and they should be running a single point of failure. But yes, we have a number of these running on uh, virtual servers. And again, two, you know, two separate physical machines that, that running on a VM. I don't know how many of these we have, but I'm guessing there's at least 30 sites running just right now. I, I, I know it's a lot. A lot um, the data synchronization between the, the, the primary and the secondary database, uh, that it doesn't happen in, in quite in real time. There's, there's a five minute to 10 minute lag, sometimes maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but generally within 10 minutes, the data that the primary writes with the database gets synced over to the, the database on Saturday. So that, that all happens behind the scenes. Normally, within, within 10 minutes, the, the two databases are synced up. That's how it's going to be. That is, um, yeah, they, they uh, both servers talk to the PLC independently, so they both need the data from the PLC themselves. So that the data is only slightly different in real time, and they're both you know, not reading it exactly at the same time. But um, the data that gets written to the database, like the one minute average is the one hour average is. The uh, UHS, all that stuff, that gets synced with the two databases on the same data. What does the same information have? Uh, about 10 minutes after the fact. Which other? So, so the, uh, not, not a switchover, but the synchronization is ongoing. It just has about a, about a 10 minute lag. So it's, it's continually updating the data 10 minutes old. Five minutes old, but within about 10 minutes, the, the same process is
Right. Okay. Um, part 60, you can have a count sale out of control four times the performance spec. You're practically familiar with this one. This is the, the worst case count failure for part 60. Um, if the analyzer fails to count by more than four times the performance spec, then the data has to be invalidated all the way back to the previous class. That's the one you really don't want. Uh, for a long time, Cedar did not do that, that uh, back invalidation automatically. We've had numerous requests to go ahead and, and do that, so we have implemented that in the Cedar software. And that uses monitor grid 74. Is that in the monitor grid you don't ever want to see? Yes, I think I have a question, question on that. We just had at one of our plants, this, they had an event just like this, and we're required to do data substitution for the mass emissions. And so our, our person was struggling with that monitor, monitor code 74 is in there, but if you do data substitution for the mass emissions, that monitor, monitor code masks it when you do your data, data totals. But we could, we could figure out how to, how, to, how to put the data in there and not change the monitor code. Okay. So okay. I don't know. I mean, do we need a, a separate monitor code that says data substitution and data was invalid or <laughs> something like that? Or, I mean, this literally happened last week, so I haven't had a chance to. It look depends. At the so the question the question had to do with data substitution after uh, monitor code seventy four, and I think this applies just not to, it's not just to seventy four. I think it's a might be it's a general question. Yeah. Um, Generally speaking, the we, we might have to go look at the exact data you, you, you're looking at, but the um, I believe the downtime, the, the calculations that calculate the percent downtime uh, count the substitute data monitor codes as downtime. I remember so, correctly, that's so that was one option. Yeah. And there's a monitor code for for data substitute. Is there a whole bunch of code, right? It's like 40 through like 51 or 52 yeah. or something. It's all so you know, we changed that monitoring code to data substitution and it's the for, for part 60 reporting and it's still calculated correctly. I believe it still counts those as the Okay. All right. Um yes. Brian. Yeah, Brian just chimed in. Yeah, he said uh, to answer Dave's question, the substituted data monitor codes are still considered to be invalid monitor codes and are downtimes. Okay, so so there, yeah, uh, that, that's the answer. So then, we, <laughs> since, so then, so then it, we should just change the monitoring codes to that we did the data substitution and yes, okay. So so pick one of those. Okay. Most of them are they're, they're in the forties to like fifty one, fifty two. Pick one of those monitor codes. It's considered valid data for aggregation purposes, but it's considered downtime for downtime calculation. So thank you, Brian, for confirming that. Obviously, he's at home listening to me. All right. Uh, okay, next slide. That was uh, monitor code 74. Monitor code 75, we've added back here in the last couple of years. Um, this is uh, something that has always been in Cedar. We just never had a, a, an explicit monitor code for it. This is the part 75 case where an hour can be valid with only two valid 15 minute blocks in the hour, as long as one or two of the other blocks have calibration and maintenance. So uh, Cedar now has an explicit monitor code for this. Ran into a case I forget where it was. I think it was Alberta where we actually needed this one. Anyway, so that is in the software now. Again, it only applies to part 75, and it is valid. All right, count checks, expired cylinders. I think I already covered this one while we were waiting for the uh, slide to come up. Uh, one thing that is on the slide here is if you print the count report and you have color turned on, we have to do this if the color is turned off, there's an option for that. The uh, expired cylinder will show up and there will be a notice in red. That's how the expired cylinder. 
Uh, the other thing I want to mention is there is a feature in the software that just automatically checks for cylinder expiration dates. Uh, it goes through all the cylinders, the California, the CJ linear cylinders, checks them all. And if any of them uh, are going to expire in the next 60 days, it starts popping an alarm. It says, hey, this cylinder is going to expire. Coming up soon. If it's a cow cylinder, it's probably not a big deal because you're probably going to change it out anyway. Cow cylinders usually are not going to get this. Uh, the only one you really might see this on realistically is a CD linear cylinder that can be fairly So you shouldn't ever, you probably won't ever see this alarm, but the check is in the system. Uh, it used to be that these checks started 45 days ahead of uh, when the cylinders expired, and we got some feedback uh, from a couple of plants saying, well, that's you know, 45 days isn't quite long enough for our, our uh, purchase and, and receive cycle, so we don't have that. Okay, CJ linearity and out of range gas. I think we already covered this. Uh, Again, there's a red notification in the report. If there's an expired cylinder for a CJ linearity, or if the uh, reference gas is, is not in the expected range. All right, report date selection. I've got some screenshots coming up. I knew you were going to do Yes. Sure. When will we start seeing the chart? When will we start seeing the calcium form? That's the question. When will we start seeing the right? Now the Caltech alarms being the cylinder base. Over the four times. Over the four times. I have to go back to that slide and look, but it's got the CEDAR release number on the bottom of the slide. So if you're at least at that CEDAR release number, um, it would be there. Uh, this, one, this one here says uh, it's at CEDAR 7.0, so if you've got CEDAR 7, you should have it. Um, yes. Brian, uh, if you're following your place or new enough to have those talks. Awesome. Okay. So well, that's the answer. <laughs> All of the sites are uh, the person who's asking has has uh, new software. Okay, so let's get back to screenshots that have to do with the report generator. Uh, we changed the date selection in the report generator. Uh, we've gotten a little bit of feedback, I think, from this group a couple of years ago, and maybe earlier, on making the uh, date selection a, a little easier and adding some more options. Um, so, we got to look at this in the um, So, the, the thing we're interested in is over here on this side where it says days. There's uh, several options here. Options to get today is, is self explanatory, so we get today. Uh, here's this other new option. Last so many days, you can pick how many days you want, and if you want today as well, you can pick the box. So that's, and that will change if you're on a monthly report. It's this month, last month, last X months, whatever. Uh, same thing with hours. I think hours actually give you, it'll give you today. Let's look at the next one. And the yellow that you see here is, is part of the software. That, that's not just something I added to this for us to look at. That, that's actually in the software. So it's whichever one is highlighted in yellow is the one that's being picked. So this one, there's a two, there's a from the two. You can pick a quarter. And I, you can pick half a year, or you can pick the entire year, which would be all four quarters. The two box is optional. If you read the two blank, all you get is this color. 
So on the now not on this. So uh, yes, but when you do select hourly, uh, you don't have the option to go type that 24 hour. Why is that? Ah, okay. You have to go A and B and put it in the default. Yeah, uh, you can turn in. <clears throat> Exactly. So, yeah, Sealer will handle 24 hour or 12 hour for me. And you can type it in uh, down here if you want to go to a specific hour. But if you use the uh, selector with the drop down, that can put it in. Yeah. Okay, I don't have that screenshot for the last place. <laughs> um, so when it comes up, it doesn't do 24 hours? No, you can type it in right there. Right here, right there, but then you click the, 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 the little button next to it. And then, then you have your drop down to select the date or time. Okay. You can't select. It's only a 12 hour format. I believe, if I remember correctly, if the operating system is set on a 24 hour clock, it will give you a 24 hour clock. If the operating system is set on a 12 hour, it will give you a 12 hour clock. I don't know. You could go in and change that, so when you can check a box and you can have one four hour form in instead of the portion of the time. It's not a bad idea. Well, I'll check it out when I get back. Okay. Make sure it's good for 24 hours to see it there. Okay, well, it should, it should be an email. So, all right. Um, quarter the, the I will mention the thing that's missing here. You see this big blank space? That's where you can pick months. Well, months don't apply at quarters, so that would just doesn't apply here. So we'll go to the next one, which I believe is a month. And here's our here's our choices. So here's our months. You know, again, we've got the year in the month. You leave the fee blank, you add, and you just get the one month. So something that trips me up every couple of years, and I have to call Brian. To Sets me straight, but um, on the year pull down, it only goes back five years. Yes, I always forget typing in. Is there any reason not to include all the years in the pull down? How far back would you like to go? I have to forever. <laughs> forever. Yeah, you can just get the dates from two and stop with it. Yeah, but I always get stuck on okay, if it's not in the pick list, then I think I can't do it. I, I know you can type it in, but then I forget. And uh, there are times we have to go back and look at data when we're doing permitting or something like sure. we're going to store the data. So. Okay, yeah, I, I know you can type it in yeah. and uh, I, I guess I could put some more some more years in the in the date pool then. No. Okay. Probably the reason is uh, the bank is in a period of five years. So it is, but I mean when we do, I mean I just got down with the exercise that pull data from mobile one for permitting. Mm -hmm. You know, so so sometimes, sometimes you got to go find. You know, it's twenty years worth yeah. of years. Wow. And this pull down? <laughs> maybe ten, five, maybe ten. I don't know. Or you can just butt Brian. I know. I know Brian <laughs> loved getting butt. So. <laughs> <laughs> you were you weren't listening, Brian. <laughs> All right. Um, the other thing, I'll, I'll, I, I know you've already seen it here, but here's this. This is a totally new option that we didn't have before. Uh, this change to so the 12 months ending, and uh, you can pick the, the uh, month, the last month of the 12 month period, and it'll print all the data for that month plus the previous 11 months. So I know that was a request of people. I think Dave, I think you might have been on that. Yep. Yeah. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I've already used it. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. I think that's all the screenshots. Oh, I did have one here for 12 months. All right. I think that's all the screenshots that I have on the report. Journal. Alarm email changes. Uh, we changed the options for alarm emails uh, to make them a little bit more granular. Um, and there's a new checkbox to completely enable or disable the alarm emails altogether. So let's go look at that screenshot. Uh, here I highlighted it in yellow for this slide. Uh, there used to uh, it used to be there was just one checkbox for serious and one checkbox for one. There was all or nothing. Uh, we asked uh, we got several requests for some more green granularity on this. So now 
So here's the master and enable disable checkbox. And then um, you can pick the, the limit, limit alarms, some <coughs> alarms, uh, calm failure alarms, and everything else. And you can pick where you, which ones you want to see and whether you want serious or warm. Any combination. Is there any thought to setting up more of like a subscription? So like say I have a user, it's my ice tech. He's not going to care about an exceedance so much as he's going to want to know when he has a comm failure. I don't Funny you should mention that because I have that exact request sitting in my to-do uh, list right now. So actually we had that request for to be able to set up two different lists of you speak to the exact scenario you're mentioning. Or possibly even to the right where you have some blank space. So for the limit, you go to this guy, it's sent to that guy. It could all be the same guy. Sure. Or you could add a list of people running. Maybe. I haven't designed the feature. I haven't even started working on it. So <laughs> the more feedback, the better here. All right. on reports uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this already even if you don't want to um, this is another feature you don't really want to see but it's in the software so um, the part is down here if there's an exceedance related to this piece of data you notice the limit here is 50 this one is considerably over the limit so that shows up in the report there is an option in the report generator to turn off the color. So if, if you have the color turned off, you won't see it. Anywhere. It will still the number will still be in bold, but that's kind of a subtle. And that's, and that's a little more subtle. Red things all in. All right, just a few state and local changes I'll mention. Um, San Joaquin Valley, if, if, if anyone here has anything in San Joaquin, not that it matters. Uh, they've completely switched over to internet submittals. They got rid of the ballot and other expansions. Um, so that's that. Uh, New Jersey, uh, the New Jersey reports of the Cedar 4 had them, Cedar 7 now has them. They've all been updated to Cedar 7. Uh, same thing with the Utah and Science Report. And there's some more changes coming up here. All of these are pretty much between now and the end of the year, the first part of 2022. In South Coast, South Coast uh, they're making some regulatory changes there. Uh, they're finally going to get rid of some of their non-intuitive calculations and uh, join the, the, the world of Part 675. So that's starting sometime in 2022. Maybe not the work, but I'm looking for it to uh, it's making sense. Um, Alberta, they got a bunch of stuff uh, changing starting January 1, so that's uh, going to be on our plates here over the next three months. In New Jersey, recently put out some clarifications on three hour rollings, uh, and that's going to be by uh, the first of the year. Uh, all right, so this is the part I really want to take a few minutes and show you. So uh, we have a new feature. This is still in development. It has not been released, um, but we can <coughs> at a point where we can uh, demonstrate it to you. Uh, for a long time, we've had a request for a cylinder manager, cylinder tracker, cylinder tool, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're just working with cylinder manager for right now. Uh, the idea is you can go into the cylinder manager and input your list of cylinders. You can do it ahead of time if you want to, or you can do it at the time the cylinder is swapped out. It's, it's up to you. Uh, and you can go into this, this tool and you can grab a cylinder and drag it over on top of an existing cylinder. And the system will propagate all of the cylinder data to the system, to everywhere it needs to go out of the system. Uh, right now, uh, 
all of that is done with either going to the receiver setting screen and typing in, you know, picking each thing individually and typing all those in, uh, or going out to the shelter and a lot of shelters have uh, touch panels out in the shelter or there's a seal in the ground line for the data line. Uh, you, you can enter that some of the data from there. And that still works. Uh, that, that's, that option isn't going to go away with this. Uh, this cylinder manager will, will, will work both ways. You, you can enter cylinder data in this tool when you put the cylinder in service, it'll take that data and it'll propagate it down. So if there are multiple things that, that test that they use that cylinder in the system, say you've got a NOx CGA and a, and a, uh, sorry, a NOx uh, linearity and CO CGA and CO span gas or NOx span gas, they all use the same cylinder. Uh, this tool will possibly when you pick that one cylinder, if one cylinder gets replaced, it'll propagate everything out to the PLC. Uh, the vendor ID, the cylinder ID, expiration date, gas list, and all the gas companies. With one action, everything would go out to the PLC. Let me just ask so the cylinder manager, you can put all our cylinders from, say, you know, one has these cylinders and the two has these and the three has these. Or I believe we have these spare, we have these yes. engineers, we've done uh, a bottle gets low, we change the bottle, we grab a spare bottle, we drag it up and one. Yes. And then we could also print that report. If you need a historical or something in the I mean, we don't have any reports for this yet, but uh, I'm kind of waiting for some feedback and it would be useful for reports. Uh, but this will also work um, if you have, uh, I know earlier it was mentioned some sites have a, like a, a rack of bottles that used to go in the areas of the park. If you move the, the bottle around to multiple shelters, and this will also work with that. So if the same bottles get used in all the shelters, when you change that, that one bottle in the system, it will propagate that change out to all the shelters by one action. That's the fact of Breeze as well, right? Uh, Breeze doesn't care about this because um, this, this is upstream of Breeze. Because when, when the cow is performed or when the, CG, when the linearity is performed, it takes whatever the current cylinder settings are and it stores, it stores that data with that test. So the, the, this system is about uh, when you do a cylinder change out, getting that new data into the PLC. Once it's in the PLC, it gets saved with, with the, the test and the breeze will catch it up. Breeze will get back. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, we, I'll, I'll move to the next slide, which has a, a screenshot, but if you want to move the screen, we actually have a live demo here, which is even better than the screenshot. So, awesome. Uh, so, while that's coming up, here's the list of available cylinders on this side. Obviously, it says that. Um, if we want to add a cylinder, you know, punch the button, and a dialog box will come up and can enter the, the cylinder information. On this side, uh, these are the ones that are all in service. This side has, there's two different views on this side. Um, the one that is selected right now is what we're calling the gas profile. And that is a list of all of the QA tests in the system and all of the bottles that are, that are used. So for example, a, a linearity in the area, you'll have a low and high. So that'll appear three times in the gas profile section. Because each of those, um, each of those levels needs a separate fill. Uh, there's also a, a uh, cylinder list. And that's just the list of all the cylinders that are currently in service. So we can take 
a cylinder from the available side, but then you can drag, drag, and drop onto the other side. And it doesn't matter which view is picked, whether we we're looking at the cylinder view or we're looking at the gas profile view, either one. We can drop it on either one and it'll it'll propagate through, through the whole system. Uh, there is some error checking in there, so um, in case I, I need to swap out a, a bottle with, you know, for my NOx and CO blended high gas bottle, I accidentally grab a low gas bottle, uh, a dialogue, or the, the dialogue is going to come up and say, you know, you, there's always a dialogue box that comes up and says, you want to confirm. And in that dialogue, there is an error notification that says uh, hey this this bottle the gas the component gases in this bottle doesn't match what what this test is expecting so that, that shows up in red um, you probably won't have any expired cylinders in here but those show up in red um, it, it does some basic error checks you know, on the cylinder All those uh, cylinder movements get taxed and automatically. Uh, yes, we're, we're, it does store uh, a history of, of what changes were made in cylinders and what cylinder got made, when and where. So. Yes. 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 Uh, right now, Peter does have informational alarms, like when the cylinder information changes, and Cedar just automatically generates an informational alarm cylinder ID change, the gas computation change. Here is the old value, here is the new value. Uh, so, yes, we will we'll, we'll bring those forward. Oh, hey, we're running. Yeah. Also, Kevin, um, yes. I have a question of what's in the gas profiles. What is in the gas profile? All right, let's uh, let's bring that up here in just a second. Right now we're on the. So on the assigned cylinder side. So here's our we get a, a little card here for each of the cylinders that are currently in use. Uh, this cylinder has some errors on it. I know you probably can't read that. But it says the cylinder's expired and it says the, the gas concentration uh, is not what's expected for the test that it's applied to. So there's the red, there's the layer of uh, In these little colored boxes right here, there's you know the CO concentration, there's the NOx concentration, and those uh, gas types are color coded. Uh, now on this side, I've got a I don't I've got a ton of Test cylinders loaded in here is kind of overkill. But uh, the, the gas concentrations are all color coded, so it's easier to kind of calculate um, Here in this, this little box is, I know you can't read this again either, but this one is saying every, this is listing all the gas profiles where this cylinder is being used. So in this case, this cylinder is being used on turbine 1A and it's being used for the NOx load pal span and the CO load pal span. The same thing again on turbine the other group. So there, there's a bunch of information packed in this. This is a little war time and it's also in development. Um, up here, we can filter if we want to filter this to say, I just want to look at the free. I can pick the end up here or the unit. One A and F, track, one B and F, track. Uh, most of those are some units. So when that happens, it will filter this list only the cylinders that are being used on, on that unit. If it's being used on another unit, that still fills up. But we're filtering just the cylinders that are being used on the cylinder. Uh, we can filter the gas profile, and that is. Uh, uh, like we can pick the low gas, we can pick the NOx gas, the high gas, linearity, CO. There's several different options in there. If you want to filter based on 
what the cylinder has got in it or what it's being used for. You can see that. And up here as well, I uh, we can filter based on what's in the cylinder. So there's, there's all, all the gas types and a whole bunch of other gas types that EPA defines that most people do. All right, so let's switch to the gas profile view. Um, and this is a combination of the unit that the, that the cylinder is used on, the uh, test that the cylinder is used for in, in, in its level, so like how span or near the unit. Uh, and that whole combination makes a, a gas profile. Um, but that's the idea. Every test in every gas level of every QA test in the system goes up here as a gas profile. And again, if we if if, uh, if we want to change one of these, we can we can pick a new cylinder over on this side and drag it over here. And like here, it's going to say, wait a minute, you just grabbed a CO2 cylinder and you're trying to drop it on an on an NO gas profile, hey, here's, here's the error message. We don't really want to do that. So, and there's an example of the error message. Um, and down here, there's the you know, cancel or confirm buttons. It also asks uh, the, the cylinder that's being taken out. We're assuming that it's going to get retired. The, the cylinder's going to get returned in that. That's how they're structured. And for some reason, you still want to use that cylinder again. You can hit this option and just put that in spare. Most of the time, it's not going to work. All right, I think I, there's a whole lot more stuff here. Um, I don't really have. How am I doing on time? Probably. Fair point. Is that stored in database somewhere? Yes, the the list of available cylinders is stored in the database. Um, so if we add a you know when we put a new cylinder here, uh, that that gets stored in the database and backed up and all the stuff database data. The uh, the in-service, this side, the in-service cylinders and the gas profiles, that is a combination of the CDR configuration and the data that's held in the um, So that, the, the, the data on this side is, this, this is what the system has been using to wet that. Yes. I have one. Um, How is the allowable range for the gas derived to account for state specific requirements. Is this a user setting? How is the allowable range determined, um, especially for state specific requirements? So as you can see here, each uh, each one of these gas profile cards has a, in this case, it's looking for NO, and there's uh, uh, these regs allow apparently two different gas ranges. Um, it is the, the answer. Where where do these allowable ranges come from? Um, they're basically built into the definition of the test. So if it's a part seventy five linearity, we know that it's going to use twenty to thirty percent below fifty percent for mid, the hundred percent for high. Um, the most of the Part 60 stuff has a, has a standard set of allowable ranges, and the Part 75 stuff has a standard set of allowable ranges. Um, if, if there's a state specific range that is not, that doesn't match the, the Part 60 allowable range, I believe we can keep that in any configuration. We have a range. Um, Dylan, is there anything else here we should show at this point? Probably the feature smart filtering from the camera. Oh, that's right. That's awesome. Okay. So, 
Um, here's our list of in-service cylinders. And you can see on this side over here, you know, here's cylinders with a whole bunch of different gases in them. So this, this uh, if we come over to the in-use side and we click on one of these cylinders, it will filter this list to cylinders that are compatible with what we just clicked over here. So in this case, uh, this one is looking for, you know, right now we've got a, a cylinder with NOx and CO in it. And it knows based on what gas profiles it's being used for, what the allowable ranges of NOx and CO are. And so over on this, once we've clicked it over on this side, and you can pull down the filter, you can see it's Here's our min and max NOx that it's looking for, and our min and max CO. Let's go through the whole list. So I think I've got a thousand cylinders loaded in here right now. That's what we're going to for this. Um, but you'll probably have, I don't know, 30, 40 cylinders, depending on whatever you've got in inventory. Potentially in this list. So by clicking this, it'll really cut down the list of cylinders you have to scroll through. They just work together. Awesome. So, <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah, we can do it the, the same thing. And that will work uh, either on, on the cylinder uh, cards or if the gas profile cards. Like it'll, it'll work on either one. Go ahead. Go. I was just going to ask, it looks like this is a web based application. Yes, uh, good observation. <laughs> yes, this is a browser based application. Um, our long term plan is to move Cedar, uh, the, the, the Cedar data monitor, and all the main the Cedar reports, all the main Cedar applications to the browser base. So this is the this is uh, some new development. So this is the first application where we've actually done a browser based application. So don't expect this next year or even the year <laughs> after that. Just hold your breath for a long time. But anyway, that's the direction we're going. This is the browser based. So I actually have two questions. One, so the, the estimate in the future. Um, I mean, I don't know if we use that. Yet. With future models that we might put and install, yes, uh, and just the ones that are present. Uh, now, the retired models that we can go on and service better places to go in and see it. Uh, those, those by default drop off the available cylinder list once they're retired. So you cannot go back. There is a there is a screen somewhere in here. It, we're, we're still working on it, but there, there is a screen in here where you can go back and look at what's been retired. Oops, I accidentally retired the one I want to go back out. Yes. Uh, we're also, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, for adding bottles, uh, we're also looking at um, compatibility with a barcode scanner. You get one of those little barcode scanners and put the in the QR code. And it'll automatically add. It, 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 it'll automatically populate the the add cylinder screen for you, and then you can you know, make sure that you brought everything in correctly and then hit OK. You can be able to retire um, add a certificate of calibers of the cert tool. Uh, it's not in the software right now, but we do have the ability to. A little database, but it's not in the software yet, where we can uh, store a screenshot of the cylinder. So, yes, short answer is yes. Uh, the, 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 the barcode scanners, it's a great idea. The, the challenge we're running into with the barcode scanners is it depends on the vendor. Uh, some of the vendors on the, on the, the search sheet for the bottle. You scan the, the QR code, and the QR code actually has the cylinder information embedded right in the code. Other vendors, uh, you scan the QR code, 
and it takes you off to a, a web link, a URL, which that's great, except the DAS sits behind the prepare. So if, if you have if you have a magic solution for how to make that work from behind the firewall, I would love to do it. So anyway. Somehow I don't think we're gonna convince IT departments to let us do the firewall. <laughs> All right, any other uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts? That's that's all I had to present on. So if you have anything else, whether on this or another topic. So, so this functionality won't be available until CDAR and data monitor are on on the web. Um no, I didn't say that, fortunately. Uh, this this is slated to come out sometime next year. I don't have a firm date on that. Uh, but this will this will run in parallel with the existing uh, desktop windows applications that Cedar has. So it's it's not an either or at the both. Of them. Other topics. Yeah. One thing I know we've talked about in the past. Any more discussion on um, you know when you're in when you're Running an audit report or a developing report, and we've got 200 parameters in there. Don't put it some kind of parameter tree on there. But yes, <clears throat> I have a plan for that. Okay. You're probably not going to like my answer. Okay. Um, the, the short answer is the it's coming. Uh, the I, I mentioned we're we're going to a browser-based interface, and we're going to add it in browser-based interface. The the platform that we're currently using. Um, it's not impossible, but it's very complicated. We, we know that the browser based uh, applications are, are much more capable. I haven't forgotten that one. I think you've asked me that like three years in a row now. Yep. And it's, it's on my <laughs> it's on my my to do list that I. I haven't even forgotten it. That one's actually in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> so with the QR codes, if, you know, assuming you all move forward with that, um, would you set it up such that you could have a QR code identifying the location, like on a rack? So you scan the QR code, you say, and then you scan the bottle, and that ties the two systems together. I hadn't thought about it, so I have the possibility of, of tying it to a specific uh, location in the rack. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting feature. I guess you'd have to tell the system how you want to identify that QR code you generate. But yeah, we would. I'm not saying you try to make it idiot proof because we all know how that works. But yeah, well, because we all think we're not idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, we have thought about because the QR codes don't always work. We have thought about uh, incorporating some OCR. Software into it so if you could scan the bottle sheet, maybe the, the every manufacturer has a different format. And the OCR vendors think that their software is wonderful and you know, the so I'm not sure if we're going to do OCR or not. Just a clarification when you say browser, that's offline. Well, I think browser, I think kind of the browser as in not connected to the internet, yeah, it does still work on in front. Okay, so, so everything here would, would be behind the firewall. So they're behind the firewall, and you can make it reach the system server, the CEDAR server. So for users that um, access the DAS and the reports and the data monitor remotely. Um, you open up CEDAR reports and you can easily bounce from one facility to another. You can't do that in the data monitor. Is there a way to add that in oh. into there? The data monitor, I mean, a little thing, but it takes it takes a minute to load. And if you need to bounce around to a bunch of different facilities, you know, save some time. I didn't I didn't think anybody wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first person to ask for that. But yeah, that, that would be useful. I mean, it's not a big deal, but that'd be useful. I mean, it's it's really how the CEDAR reports works that way, and you can bounce from one yeah. facility to the next really quickly. Yeah, the CEDAR reports in, I think the database has a, a two, okay. but the reports are probably two more. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.
I, I think I, I think I can do it in a month. Oh, I know I can just. Wait for the web version. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can do it sooner than that. All right. All right, Dave, did we extend your list of, uh, of uh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, you'll see me at lunch. I'm sure. I, 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 I got one for the last hour. <laughs> You're waiting for the last hour. Well, I don't know if I'll, I'll okay. I, 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 I got to go to the airport. I, I, I will bring up one more thing. We've talked about it before, and I don't know if it fits here or not, but we talked before about the way that the hourly calculations are made. It's the down and then some, or the sum and then down. And we continue to have, yes. I know we've switched a number of our facilities over to the calculate the, the mass emissions on a minute by minute basis and then sum it for the hour. Okay. Is there more thought on that, whether or not to standardize that across the whole platform? I don't know if I have an answer for that. Brian would probably have a better okay. answer. I think um, Brian has an answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Robbie Melinder says you can have multiple sessions of data monitor up at once. And then Brian says to answer Dave's question, there is a limited web version of the data monitor. It doesn't contain all of the same functionality, but has most of the same info. Okay. So, all right. So that's a different question. Uh, yes, we do have a a um, a limited version of the Cedar Data Monitor right now that is browser based. Um, a, a few sites are actually using that. Um, it, it's not something we get a lot of requests for. But the, the data monitor screens are available in the web browser. Oh, Brandon has to say that. Uh, but you, you, that wasn't the answer to your question. Yeah, that, it, that's more of a fundamental how the software is set up. And, you know, like, you know, we're, we're that goes to Cedar can be configured to do it either way. Yeah. In whether to, to calculate mass at the minute, sum it all up, or calculate mass at the hour, and then sum those up. Cedar can be configured either way. And it really goes down to what is the permitting rate that require on the two versions. I mean, where, where we've really seen it, we just had another another instance where it, it caused what we call an indicated excess of a limit. So when you're in calibration for a large chunk of the hour, your PPM values are only going to be average based on the 40 minutes of the hour, right? And if you have a massive change in load and you do the calculations and, and, it's, and it's calculating the mass based on your fuel flow for the hour, which is not masked, you get all 60 minutes of the, of, of the, of the fuel flow, then you can see that your average, your, your concentration data is average on a different data set than your feed input and it can skew things. It, it, it pops up every once in a while where we have it. It, it used to be a big deal. Uh, you know, there's back 15, 20 years ago, almost all the limits were based on block hours or longer. Right. But as we've gotten more into uh, 16 minutes of rolling and even shorter, you know, starting to shut down limits. Okay. And load, loads are changing more. And I, I think that's sure. really what's driving it. If your load doesn't change, you're not going to have an issue. Right. Yeah, instead of savings, that's fine. So, uh, yeah, Brian has a better answer as to whether that's something you continue to do now or if it's more of a piece by piece. Um, any, any other questions? I'd love to talk. All right. <laughs> well,